Hi, I'm Dave Shuttler, a professor emeritus of entomology at The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. I go by the professional nickname of The Bug Doc. I was a professor of urban landscape entomology from 1990 to 2017. I dealt with the insects and mites that attack urban trees, shrubs, flowers, and turf grass. My research centers around the management of turf grass insect and mite pests. I visited the United Arab Emirates in 2016 when Syngenta sponsored me to talk about all of the turf grass insects with an emphasis on how Syngenta's products could be used. I have maintained contact with our local sponsor, Polyclean and Katib, and through a recent discussion, we decided to offer a series of training seminars, first covering important insect pests, but also covering other topics of interest to you, the turf grass managers. Since this is a new project, we certainly welcome your feedback as to the usefulness of these seminars, and please discuss additional topics with Katib and his employees. Before we get started on our topic for today, I want to point out that our turfgrass scientists and educators at The Ohio State University have developed several educational programs specifically for golf course and sport field managers. These courses are offered as a continuing education program, and upon successful completion of the courses, students will receive a certificate of completion. Many turfgrass managers take these courses to demonstrate to their employers that they are continuing their training and improving their knowledge about professional turfgrass management. You can find more information on these programs by simply searching Ohio State Turf Certificates using the internet. So let's get started with our discussion about the turfgrass pests that we call white grubs or simply grubs. What are white grubs? Well, white grubs are the larvae of scarab beetles. In this region of the world, scarabs were considered to be sacred emblems to the ancient Egyptians, as the species they observed roll around a ball of animal dung, buried it, and magically, a new beetle arose. White grubs have all the features of an insect. They have a head region where the mouth parts are located, as well as other sensory organs. The thorax consists of three segments, each with a pair of small legs. The abdomen consists of nine to 10 visible segments with no appendages. The general shape of the body is C-shaped. Like all insects, the grubs have openings on the sides of the thorax and abdominal segments through which they breathe. These are called spiracles. So, if turf-infesting white grubs are closely related to dung beetles, what do the grubs eat in the turf grass environment? Most turf managers would quickly state, roots. In fact, white grubs eat roots, but they eat the roots as they are devouring other organic matter that has accumulated at the top of the soil profile. I state that white grubs eat everything in front of them but their goal is to ingest organic matter that is digested and used for energy. If you think about it, the highest amount of organic matter in a turf grass profile is in the thatch layer and the one centimeter or two of soil below the thatch. Grubs that damage turf generally feed in the soil thatch interface. Long-term studies of white grub populations in turf grass habitats have shown that white grubs are rarely a problem in newly established turf. Once the turf has been growing for three to four years, white grubs soon arrive and they can build up damaging populations. White grubs damage turf directly by severing roots and crowns, but various birds and mammals will dig them up for food. This can cause additional damage to the turf. All white grubs go through the same life stages. They are insects that have what entomologists call a complete life cycle. In this kind of life cycle, the immature or larval stage looks very different than the adult stage. You're familiar with other insects with a complete life cycle, like caterpillars turning into butterflies or moths and maggots turning into flies. 
These complicated life cycles are believed to help insects escape predators and diseases because the larvae usually live in a different habitat than the adult. The white grub life cycle starts with an egg. The egg hatches into the larva or grub, and this first substage is called the first instar. The first instar feeds and fills its exoskeleton. Once the exoskeleton has been filled, the larva must molt in order to become larger. The first instar molts into the second instar. The second instar repeats the feeding process, then molts into the third instar. These third instar grubs can be 20 to 50 times the body weight of the newly hatched first instar. So you can imagine that the third instar grubs are the ones that cause most of the damage to the turf. When the third instar has finished its development, it digs deeper into the soil and forms a pupa or transformation stage. The pupa doesn't move much because all of its internal organs are being reshaped to perform the task needed by the adult beetle. After three to four weeks, the adult beetle emerges. I'm going to use this life cycle chart to illustrate the normal annual life cycle of white grubs. Notice that I'm using a species from the northern hemisphere, which technically most of you are located. In general, most of the northern hemisphere species emerge as adult beetles during late spring into early summer. Some species may feed as adults on plant leaves, but most simply emerge at night, mate, and then return to the soil to lay eggs. The eggs are laid in moist organic soil. Virtually all grub species lay dehydrated eggs that must absorb moisture from the surrounding soil before the embryo can develop. If the eggs don't absorb moisture within 48 to 72 hours, the egg will die. The eggs develop for two to three weeks before the first instar grub emerges. The first instar grub quickly digs to the soil thatch interface and begins feeding on organic matter. For most species, the first instar grubs feed for two to three weeks, then they dig deeper into the soil and spend a week molting into the second instar grub. The second instar grub returns to the soil thatch interface to continue feeding for another three to four weeks. Again, the grub digs down, molts, and returns to the soil surface to feed. By late September into October, these partially mature third instar grubs dig deeper into the soil and spend the winter in a dormant state. When the soil is warm in the spring, the successfully overwintered grubs return to the soil thatch interface to finish their feeding. After a couple of weeks of feeding, the mature grubs dig deeper into the soil to form their pupation chambers. The pupa usually takes about a month to complete its transformation into the adult. On the other hand, if we have an annual white grub species that lives in the southern hemisphere, the life cycle is modified to match these southern climatic conditions. Instead of spring and early summer being in May into July, the adults lay eggs in September into November. The three instars of the grubs are active from October through March. In the case of the African black beetle, notice that the adult beetles overwinter from February through September. Now let's keep this in mind when we discuss what we believe to be African black beetles in the Middle Eastern countries. I'm afraid that neither of the annual life cycle charts, whether for the Northern Hemisphere or the Southern Hemisphere, is really correct for our region. If you look at the map of the Earth, Southern Florida is about the same latitude as the United Arab Emirates. Now here is a chart from an entomologist who ran light traps in three locations south to north in Florida. In central and northern Florida, she found that mass chafers only had one adult flight, which meant that they were undergoing the traditional one life cycle per year pattern. However, the data from South Florida indicated something very different. There were two adult flights per year. This indicates that the beetle was able to complete two cycles in a single year. Let's look closer at the African black beetle stages. 
The adult beetles are generally a shiny black color, but newly emerged beetles can have a dark reddish brown color. The beetles are about two centimeters long and broadly oval in outline. The beetles can be attracted to artificial lights at night. Unfortunately, there are more than a dozen species of Heteronychus that occurs across the subtropical regions of Africa and Asia. The third instar grubs are quite large and can grow to nearly four centimeters in length and be about one centimeter wide. Unfortunately, all of the Heteronychus grubs appear identical in form, so microscopic examination of the mouthparts is needed to determine species. The pupae are a little more than two centimeters in length and are fairly typical for all scarabs. When I go to the distribution maps for the African black beetle, this is what is shown. Notice that the true African black beetle appears to be a southern hemisphere species. Now I mention this because it is very difficult for a southern hemisphere species to modify its annual life cycle to develop properly in the northern hemisphere. The same is true with northern hemisphere species being able to adapt their life cycles for living in the southern hemisphere. Here is a PowerPoint presentation that I captured off the internet. This was a talk given by an entomologist in Madagascar who was discussing common white grubs that attack maize in that country. Notice that not only are there two species of Heteronychus involved, but a closely related genus, Heterocornus, is present and looks nearly identical to the other two species. In summary, I implore you that I need some specimens, especially adult beetles, so that I can have some scarab taxonomists look at them closely to determine exactly what species we are dealing with in our Middle Eastern turf grass zones. Your grubs may actually be the African black beetle that has modified its life cycle to survive in your climate or it may be another beetle that originally developed in your region. Fortunately, we can manage the grubs irrespective of which species is present. Now, entomologists use the pattern of bristles located on the tip of the abdomen to identify genera and sometimes even species of grubs. This pattern is called the raster pattern. All of the Heteronychus species have very similar raster patterns. They have a broadly rounded anal slit with an irregular, densely packed group of bristles nearest to the anal slit. Before that zone, there are irregularly scattered smaller bristles. Other potential species in your region may have longitudinal rows of bristles, which are very different. Heteronychus grubs can be identified to species, but you need a microscope and dissecting equipment to do so. Each species will have slightly different bristle patterns on the head capsule, modifications of the mandible teeth, and different patterns of hairs, bristles, and spines on the undersurface of the labrum. The labrum is the front flap of the mouth parts. There are no major differences generally in the raster patterns. There are many ways to sample or monitor white grub populations. One of my favorite techniques is to use a golf course cup changer. Pull a plug where you suspect grub activity. Turn the plug soil side up and split the plug towards the root zone. Grubs are usually easy to find in the soil thatch interface. The beauty of a cup changer plug is that it is almost exactly one tenth of a square foot. So if you find an average of one grub per sample, you have approximately 10 grubs per square foot, which is definitely a population that can cause visible damage. The cup changer sample can be placed back in the hole, tamped down, and leave almost no evidence of the sampling. Now a sod cutter can quickly sample larger areas. One to two meter strips are all that are needed. The turf can be easily looked under and then replaced without causing much damage. Most of the white grub adults are active at night and most are attracted to artificial lights. Insect light traps can be purchased for about $200 US and these will last for years. Insects are attracted to the ultraviolet light used in these traps. When flying insects hit the light trap veins, 
they drop into a container below that has a killing agent in it. The next morning, the insects can be dumped out, sorted, and counted. In the tray shown is a single night's catch. I've sorted out the mass chafers on the right. The other piles are army worms, cut worms, sod web worms, and other common turf grass pests. I know of several superintendents that use a simpler light trap method. One places a bucket of water under the night light just outside his office door. He checks the water every morning to see if any grub adults are floating on the water. When he begins to see the adult beetles, he can make his plans to apply grub controls. Here are two years of light trap catches of the mass chafer, a common turf grass pest here in Ohio. Notice that the population can vary considerably from year to year. In 1986, and those data aren't shown here, Ohio had fairly normal rainfall in July, the time that mass chafer eggs are laid. You can see that in the following year, 1987, we had quite a large emergence of the adult beetles. This indicates that the normal rainfall allowed for proper egg development and larval survival. However, in 1987, there was a significant drought from July through August. This meant that the mass chafer eggs would have difficulty in developing and hatching. And this was seen in the following summer of 1988 when the beetles caught in the light trap were greatly reduced. Another use of light trapping data is to better time grub control products so as to optimize their control. Remember that the best target for your grub insecticide is the first instar grub. So by observing the peak adult flight of my mass chafers and knowing that the eggs take about three weeks to hatch, I can apply my grub insecticide about four weeks after the peak flight. This ensures that I have the highest concentration of my grub insecticide in the soil thatch zone when the first instar grubs begin to feed. Since my grub insecticide also has a residual activity, this residue will kill any additional grubs that hatch from the eggs laid after the peak adult flight. Well, I've spent enough time talking about the life cycles of white grubs and identification characteristics. Now let's turn our attention to control of the white grubs. Now I break white grub controls down into four different timings. Prevention means that I'm going to put down an insecticide before a new set of eggs hatch. The idea here is that several grub controlling insecticides can have active residuals that remain in the soil thatch zone. The beauty of these insecticides is that I can put them down whenever it is convenient for my operation as long as I make the application before the grub eggs hatch. Notice that we have two insecticides that have long residual activity periods in the soil thatch interface chloranthronyloprol or acelaprin, and clothianidin. I'm not sure that you have access to clothianidin in all of your countries because it is a powerful neonicotinoid and some countries have limited its use. Speaking of neonics, imidacloprid and thiamethoxam are also in this chemical category group. They have shorter effective residual periods in the soil thatch interface you can only expect about one to two months of residual activity. Also note that imidacloprid is susceptible to photodegradation. You got sun in your region? <laughs> if you make a liquid application of imidacloprid, make sure to hit the irrigation in those areas that you have treated as soon as you can. Otherwise, apply it late in the day so that your night irrigation will water it in. Now, early curity means that the small first or second instar grubs are actively feeding at the soil thatch interface. In this kind of application, you're not relying on the residual abilities of the insecticide. You make the application, water it in, and the grubs immediately ingest it. As we have described before, the third instar grubs are much larger, so they need more insecticide to be ingested in order to kill them. In my experience, clothianidin is the best at this, followed by imidacloprid. 
A celebrant has poor ability to kill large grubs. Rescue treatments are when the white grubs were missed and they are now causing turf death or animals are digging up the area. You need something that has known contact toxicity. That is, if the insecticide residue contacts the insect's exoskeleton, it will penetrate the insect and kill it. Unfortunately, the only such product in the United Arab Emirates is clothianidin. In the United States, we still have the organophosphate trichloroform, or dilox, and the carbamate, or carbaryl, or 7. Many Middle Eastern countries seem to restrict the use of these insecticides. The key to having a rescue treatment work best is to heavily irrigate the turf the day to hours before the application, then apply one to two centimeters of irrigation immediately after the application. This is an insecticide efficacy chart that I constructed using all of the published data on white grub control trials made in the United States. I want to use this chart to demonstrate the residual activity of the insecticides that we have just mentioned. In this chart, most of the annual white grubs lay eggs in late June into mid-July, so the May and June applications would be that early preventive period. The July into mid-August would be when first and early second instars are present, or the early curative strategy. The mid-August to mid-September application would be the late curative period. Let's look at imidacloprid and thiamethoxam applied in May. Notice that we have efficacies below 90%. However, when the same insecticides are applied in June, we have 90% control or better. What does this tell us? Well, simply that the residues that remain from a May application have dissipated enough to allow some of the grubs to escape being killed. However, the June residuals are effective. Now, if we look at the clothianidin and acelaprin May applications, the target grubs that arrive in July are killed above the 90% level. This tells us that the active residual of those two insecticides are much longer than the previous two. The early curative treatments seem to work fine for all four insecticides, and the late curative abilities are also pretty good. Now, how are we going to approach control of the black beetles that seem to be common in the Middle Eastern countries? My thoughts are that we may have two possibilities concerning the biology of these grubs. There may be two generations, or there may be continuous development of the black beetles with adults laying eggs when other weather and soil conditions are suitable for egg development. If we have two generations, the most likely times for egg laying would be October and November, then again in April and May. This means that an early curative treatment of any of the grub insecticides would have maximum effect if applied in November. This would be followed with another application in May to take out the summer generation. Now, on the other hand, if we have mixed populations throughout the year, you'll just have to start at one time with the understanding that any time you pick, there will likely be mature third instar grubs and pupae that are not killed. You'll likely have to follow up with a second application after about three months. The second application would be to target any new grubs that are hatching from the adults that resulted from the grubs and pupae that you didn't kill with the first application. Well, that ends my presentation. Over time, I hope to get specimens of the adult beetles that you are experiencing so that I can get them properly identified.